Before I start with the session, I would like to congratulate the organizers for making this great work camp. And I hope I'll see you tomorrow at uh, the Contributors Day. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be here to speak. So we've traveled a long, long, long time to, to be here. Actually, 15 hours of flight. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about WordPress migration today because uh, when I well, when they asked me to, to give a talk here, uh, I talked about, um, okay, so nowadays most of the people talk about WordPress security or uh, performance, and no one really talks about migrations. And migrations is a big part of what we do. Uh, all of us, we develop websites locally on, or on testing servers, and after that we have to deploy those websites to our live environment. And that's not really something simple. Uh, in other words, I'm going to talk about how to, how to improve your migration process and how to do it without losing data or without your visitors being affected by the migration. Another thing about migrations is uh, that if you are migrating a really popular website, a huge website, then you really need to consider uh, some things like DNS propagation and uh, data discrepancies. So before we start, uh, just a few words about uh, about me, I have seven years of uh, WordPress experience, and at the beginning, uh, I simply created a web website for friends. After that, for clients, and then I joined SiteGround. Uh, we're a web hosting provider that provides a managed WordPress hosting service, uh, and I've been with SiteGround for the last six years. Uh, I started as a technical support guy, and right now, right now, I'm the second in seniority after our chief technical officer. I also love traveling the world, that's why I come to conferences every two months probably to the States and world camps are part of my favorites and I'm addicted to extreme sports. So introduction to migrations, most of the people think that it's easy to migrate a WordPress website. You just get a box, put the files and the database there and that's it. But that's not really how it happens in reality. So if you open Google and search for website migrations gone bad you will see that some of the results, and that's like 80% of them, contain the word WordPress. So what is so difficult about migrating to WordPress website? And why people struggle with it? Well, the thing is that most of the people don't have a plan. And you don't want to look like that guy. You need a plan in order to successfully migrate your website. And in order to do that, you need some preparation work. So, before you begin with the migration, you really need to sit down and, first of all, see if it is a development environment that you will be migrating or a real website that's up and running and you're switching web hosting providers or you're moving everything to another server. So, there are two scenarios here. The first one is, if you're migrating a real website, you need to actually discuss that with your client and get some information about the website. So you need to schedule the migration and to properly do that you have to analyze the visitors habits and when the website is accessed by many people and if you have some upcoming promotions. So you also need to inform your users about the migration. That's a pretty much obligatory if you're migrating a live website that's really popular. And the final thing is to prepare for downtime. Even if you don't expect downtime, you should prepare for it. Because I've migrated thousands of websites, and if you don't prepare for downtime, you're pretty much screwed. Because sooner or later, you will face issues. So to schedule the migration, you should check your traffic. And also keep in mind, of course, upcoming promotions. Because if you have a WordPress website that uses, for example, WooCommerce or another plugin that helps you to sell, you know, to sell your products online, then you need to take care of that. If you don't, uh, then during the migration people may order some products and the orders, orders may go into the old database and you don't want that to happen. You'll see later why. Don't forget users' habits and behavior. If they open your website, uh, for example, when they come back from work on their mobile devices, then you don't really want to perform that migration at the same time. Or if you do, then make sure to put a banner or a maintenance page in order to avoid those issues. Also be sure that you'll be able to coordinate the migration with your technical guys, with the technical support of your web hosting provider or, or with your system administrators. 
Um, just to get an idea, how many of you here are system administrators? I mean, you pretty much manage your servers or you rely on web hosting. Do that. Okay, thanks. So, to notify your users, add a banner to your site, send some notifications to your registered users, and try to blog post. Like, for example, we're going to migrate the whole data center in about a month. That's like 3,000 servers, and that's a physical migration. We will also make some migrations over the wire, but we're making sure that we will pretty much inform everyone about that, and if someone needs something custom, we will set up it the way the client wants it. So, before you do that, make sure that your client will be happy with the time the migration will perform and the way it will perform. Also use social media. So, the first thing that you have to remember, and it's probably the most important thing of this presentation, that you need to perform a dry run migration. You don't want to simply migrate your website and after that find in the middle of nowhere with thousands of issues that you need to resolve. So what is a dry run migration? A dry run migration is to create a copy of your existing website, move it to the new server, test it from the new server, and once you verify that everything works as expected, <coughs> sync the rest of the data that has changed during your tests. And if you don't do that, you pretty much have a website that people will open from the old location and from the new location, and you will get data in both databases and at the same time, unexpected issues may appear. For example, uh, when I performed a migration for uh, one of our big uh, clients, uh, they informed me that they have an additional SSL certificate like three minutes before the final sync. And pretty much we had to find a new IP and put it on the server, install the SSL certificate, and that's not something that you do at the last moment. You need to be prepared for that. So if you do a driver in migration, you'll be able to find that, for example, the checkout page is not working because the SSL is not installed. Other than that, you pretty much find yourself resolving a lot of issues after that. You need to resolve those issues before you switch to the new server. So the first thing to do is to create a backup of your website and transfer it to the new server. You have so many options here. Uh, but I've listed the two most popular. And the one that I use is to use an SSH connection to the server to create a backup of the website. And in order to do that, I use the commands that I listed over there on the slide. It's MySQL dump, the name of the database, and we output that to an SQL file. And after that, I simply create a tar archive of the whole, uh, of the whole website, and we'll later move this backup to the new server. The other option is to, use, is to use backup software, such as uh, plugins for WordPress. They will pretty much do the same, but you will not use the command line, you use only a plugin, and they will create a backup, like for example, backup body. You can after that use it to restore uh, the website on the new server. So the next thing is to migrate and to restore the backup. Uh, again, you have several options, and it also depends on the hosting environment, which option you, you will choose. So, let's say that you have a VPS with 100 websites, 100 cPanel accounts, because cPanel is probably the most popular management system for, for web hosting providers. And you need to migrate all of them, and not one single website at a time. So, in order to do that, you may use the tools that are provided by cPanel, if you're using cPanel. Uh, it, also, it also works with uh, uh, other control panels, for example, direct admin, they have their own tool, but cPanel is the most popular, and the following tools that I mentioned here, restore PKG and PKG account, uh, they pretty much create a full backup of the whole cPanel account with all the email accounts, SSL certificates, everything you can think of, databases, files, and after that, you just use another tool, that is the restore PKG, to pretty much extract that, it will automatically create the cPanel account on the new server, and then you just need to forward all the requests to the new server. But if you are not using cPanel, for example, you are moving a website from uh, one managed web hosting provider to another, you won't have, uh, you may not even have SSH access to the website. In that case, you need to download uh, the website through FTP or ask the support, uh, the support of the provider to create a backup for you, and after that, migrate. 
but in my opinion, if you have direct SSH access to your server, use it. It's not so complicated, it's not rocket science, it's just three commands. The first one that I mentioned was to simply create the backup and after that to, uh, to move it. In order to move it, you may use the rsync command. It's a command that uses the SSH protocol, so instead of FTP, you just use the rsync command, give the IP address of the new server, and then the file is transferred to the new server. After that, you access the new server through SSH and restore this backup. You can also use uh, SCP or FTP if you, if you don't have other type of, uh, of access. Uh, you may also use WPCOI in order to create a backup of, uh, of, your, of your website. It's really convenient, but if you need to migrate 100 or 200 websites, then you should better be looking at other tools because it will take you too much time to do that. So, here's one common problem when migrating WordPress websites. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with PHP serialized data, so if you're familiar, please raise your hand. Okay, pretty much like 34%. The problem is that if you migrate the website from one server to another, um, the WordPress database is full of such entries. Like for example, here we see a path to a CSS file, and this path is serialized, which means that the string that you see home www.beta.wp.content uh, is long 59 characters. And if you move that site to another server and the path is changed, the path is home to username that would be content. It's no longer 59 characters, and that should be changed in the database. If you don't do that, many, many issues may occur. Like, for example, you may not be able to use an upload functionality of your template, or some of the files may not be loaded at all. And that should be fixed. In order to fix it, there are two tools. Uh, one of them is WPCOI, which is my favorite. There is an option, and you just tell WPCOI, I need to replace that string with that string. It replaces every occurrence of the first string in the database, and at the same time, it fixes the serialized data. The other tool that many WordPress developers use is uh, an online tool that you just upload the backup of your database. Uh, that's the URL. Um, I will later upload the slides and tweet so you don't need to write it down. And you just upload an SQL backup of, uh, of, your, of your database and the tool will simply give you another version that you may download and everything will be fixed in the SQL backup. Some people don't use it because they pretty much don't want to provide their database backups to, to the guys that created the tool, but if, if it's something that's not so important for you, you may use it as well. So, once you're done with migrating and restoring, you should test your website. And the best way to do that is to use your domain name without pointing it to the new server. And in order to do that, you may use your local host file. Your local host file is a file that sits on every computer, it doesn't matter what's your operating system. You may be using Mac OS or Windows or Linux, whatever. So, uh, in this file, you can specify an IP address, and after that, specify your domain name. And when you open your domain name in your browser, you will not open the website from the server which actually hosts your website, but from the new server which uses this IP address. So when you do that, you won't have to configure your WordPress website to use a temporary URL. You won't have to change all the serialized data that I mentioned. So for example, if you create a website on a development server and you configure it to use a subdomain name, then once it goes live, you need to, to change again the domain name and all the, all the serialized data. So, you may just add this line to your host file and ask your client to add that to their host file. Uh, the location of the host file depends on your operating system, but pretty much uh, on Linux is etc host, on Mac OS it depends on your home folder. Um, once you do that, uh, you may be able to test all the different features, because you have already transferred the website, the SSL certificates, and you'll be able to, to test uh, the checkout pages uh, and everything else. It depends on the template. And of course, the plugins that you're using. So, the other thing that you should test on the new server is loading speed and reliability. If you are migrating your website from a dedicated server to a virtual private server, then 
probably the dedicated server has more CPU and more memory available. And you really need to make sure that on the new server, your website will run as fast as on the old server, and it will be able to handle all the visitors that you used to handle on the old server. So that's something you should, you should test. And in order to test it, uh, you may use automation tools. One of them is called Siege. Uh, I didn't add it to, to the sites because it's, uh, it's more an advanced tool, but if you're interested, uh, we can talk about it later. So pretty much it simulates access from thousands of computers, and it finally gives you the number of hits your server was able to handle, and the number, uh, the number in percentage of requests that uh, have been denied or have been accepted by the server. So once you perform the dry run migration, you're good to go in to migrate your site for real. And to do that, without any issues, you need to create a maintenance page. So that's just a simple HTML here. Uh, you can create your own. Uh, but why do you need a maintenance page? You need a maintenance page because you need to perform a final sync of the data. And when you perform a final sync of the data, you don't really want your website to be available for your visitors. Uh, because you're migrating and if at the same time someone orders something from your site or creates an account, that account will be saved in the database on the old server and you want it to be saved in the database on the new server. So the final thing is something important and it takes just five minutes, that's it. So you put your website in maintenance and my advice is to use a maintenance HTML. Uh, I'll tell you in two minutes why. Um, during the site, uh, when the site is in maintenance, the people won't be able to access uh, any of uh, any of your of your of your pages and of your website. Uh, but that's normal, and as I've said, you have previously informed the users about that. The idea here is that uh, you you just need to create a new SQL backup of the database and replace the whole database on the new server. So this way you will have the most up-to-date content and you will be sure that it is the most up-to-date content because the website is in maintenance. And I mentioned that you have to use a maintenance HTML file because if you just put your WordPress website into maintenance through the default functionality, then some of your, for example, users that post articles and create menus on your website, if, if you have such users, may not be aware, they may have not read their emails and notifications, and they may create pages. But if you use a maintenance HTML, you may also use the following code in your HD access file. So I'll briefly go through each and every one line here to explain what it does. So we're using Motorewrite, it's an Apache module, and what it does is to rewrite all the requests, so everyone who opens your website, it doesn't matter if the guy is an administrator or just a visitor, will be redirected to this maintenance.html file. And you can add certain IP addresses in the rules, the second line here that says if the remote address is this IP address, then this guy who's using this IP address will not be forwarded to the maintenance.html page. The idea is that if you're migrating the site and you need to check something during the migration, you may add your IP address here, and this means that you will have full access to the website, but everyone else will be redirected to the maintenance, to the maintenance file. And what else uh, we're doing here? Uh, we're also setting the status of the request to 503, which pre pretty much tells browsers and also tells Google that this website is temporarily unavailable. So Google will know that it will open the site again after the specified time in the last line, that's retry after. You may change that, for example, to 300 seconds or 5,000 seconds. It depends on how much time you need to perform the actual migration. And the other lines that you see, they pretty much check if the maintenance HTML file is present on the server and if there is another file called maintenance.enable. If you don't have this maintenance.enable file, it's just an empty file, then the rewrite rules will not work. So if you don't use a maintenance.html file, uh, what can also happen is uh, that if you're using the default maintenance functionality of WordPress, one may open the login page directly and create an account. So that's an issue. And I talked about the final data sync and DNS propagation. So the final data sync should be performed during maintenance and not before that or after that. Otherwise, you will end up with two versions of the database 
that you pretty much have to manually add it after that. And here's an explanation how this works. So let's say that you have performed the migration at 10 a.m. this morning. And after that at 10.05, you have pointed your domain name to the new server. Okay, that's really nice, and all the new users will open your website from the new server. But what happens to people that opened your website like 10 hours ago, yesterday? They cached the information about the DNS, and their computers are still resolving the domain name to the old IP address. So if they open the website again, they will open the website from the, web, from the old server. So you have two options here. You may disable the website on the old server, but that's not really an option because if it's a popular website and you're making a profit out of it, you don't really want that to happen because most of the people who have accounts on your website will need to log in, access their accounts, order something or write a new post or read something that's available only for registered users. So you have to find a way to actually deliver the content to those users without making any other changes related to DNS. And pretty much DNS is not the solution here. The first solution is to use, is to use remote MySQL connection. The idea is that when someone opens the website on the old server, the website on the old server will be configured to use the MySQL database on the new server. And if someone orders a product, then this product, uh, the, the order for this product, will be added to the correct database on the new server. If you don't do that, you risk to have two orders for two different products with one and the same ID. And if you have one and the same ID for two different orders, then how do you manage the orders? And how do you import them from the old database to the new database? It's pretty much impossible. I mean, I've, when I started uh, with WordPress migrations, and not only WordPress migrations, but also Magento, for example, it's a really difficult application because it uses foreign keys in the database. It's pretty much a big mess. But uh, it's really difficult, and if you don't create a remote MySQL connection from the old server to the new one, uh, then eventually, after 24 hours, once the propagation is over, your users that have accessed the website on the old server will start opening the site from the new server. And they will contact you and tell you, okay, I have ordered this product, but I don't see it anymore. I don't see the, the order. And that's because they will be opening the site from the new server and the data won't be there. The other thing that you may do, if, for example, you have SSH root access to the server, is to use another method to redirect all the traffic. And it's much more convenient because remote MySQL is something you can do for one website. But let's say that you're migrating the server with 300 websites. You have to edit 300 WP config PHP files and change the MySQL there. So that's not really an option for such a huge migration. So what you can do is use IP tables redirects. So when a request goes to your server before it even reaches the web server, the Apache web server, and it reaches the WordPress website itself before you see SQL queries to the database, this request goes through, uh, through the TCP stack. And what you can do is to pretty much use IP tables on Linux boxes to tell all requests that are for this IP address should be forwarded to another IP address before they even hit the web server. And in order to do that, those are the commands that you, that you have to use. So you need root access to your, to your server. If you don't have root access, you may ask your, your support to your web hosting provider to do that for you. So what pretty much we're doing here is we're using network address translation. And if you're familiar with networking, that should be something fairly easy to understand. Uh, you know, if you're not, just think of it as a redirection, but this redirection works on a much lower level. So you don't even reach the WordPress website. This redirection works for all types of websites and all types of applications. It doesn't mean uh, that it works only for, for WordPress, it works for WordPress, for Java-based applications, .NET ASP, whatever you can think. So what we're telling here are, is that uh, all requests that come for the old IP address, I've just mentioned old IP address here, should be forwarded to the new IP address. And that's it. Once you do that, the TCP traffic from the old server will be forwarded to the new server. But be careful with that thing, because if you have just one IP address on the old server, 
the moment you execute those commands, you won't be able to access this server anymore. Because all the requests will be forwarded to the new server. So make sure to use a secondary IP address that won't be forwarded and you'll be able to use to, to access the server in case you need to copy files or whatever you need to copy from the old server. For example, you forgot an IP address. If, if, if you have just one IP address and you make the redirection and you need access to the server, you need to call the data center technicians and tell them, okay, go reboot the server and reboot it into single user mode so that I'll be able to remove those, those redirects from there. So be careful with that thing. Uh, something else that's uh, really important is that some people ask questions like, uh, okay, but what happens if I use a plugin to, to migrate to my website and after that some of the data is missing like uh, orders, templates, and what should I do though? They usually panic, they point the domain name back to the old server and that's a huge mistake. If you have data missing, then you better talk to, to the support guys or to your system administrators or developers if, if, you, if you know such guys or if you are a developer. Uh, you don't really need to point it back because if you do that, you have more missing data. Because some of the orders and uh, some of the files will be uploaded on the new server and you have to manually merge the two websites. And merging SQL data is not something that's really easy. I mean, just for two orders, the last time uh, I had to deal with a really complex migration, I dedicated like six hours for two orders. It was a Magento website, it was not a WordPress website, but it's pretty much the same. So don't ever point the domain name back to the old server unless something is really broken, like for example, the checkout page. If it doesn't work, then you may put a maintenance page, fix it, and after that, the website will be working. But other than that, if you point it back, then the DNS propagation will mess up everything, and data will be added to both databases. So, some key takes. Every migration is unique. Don't assume, but plan your migration. So, if you have like six SSL certificates on the old server, and on the new server you have five IP addresses, you need one more IP address. And it's, it's common sense for that, but most of the people think that just moving the files and database without even taking care of serialized data is something that will work out of the box for them. So that's not going to happen. Always plan the, the migration. If it's complicated, then you migrate to 300 websites. Start with just one. After that, after that, migrate the others. And this way you'll be able to pull it out without any downtime. Or the downtime, the downtime will be the five minutes of maintenance that you need to perform the final sync. Always test. Don't assume that something will work because it used to work on the old server. The PHP version on the new server may be different. The MySQL version may be different. Uh, I've even saw websites that use Java or .NET ASP integrations into WordPress. And you can't expect something like that to work on the new server if there is no Java installed on the new server. So that's something you should consider. And take care of DNS propagation issues. If you're migrating just one website, it's fairly easy. You just need to edit the WP config PHP file, change the MySQL settings, set the new server, the IP address instead of local host that has been defined in there. And once you do that, all the requests, all, all the MySQL queries will be added to, to the new database. And if you have root SSH access, use the IP tables for that. It's really handy. With the IP tables redirect, I forgot to mention something, but it's really important. Let's say that you have a VPS with 100 websites, and you need to migrate just 50 of those websites. But all the 100 websites use one of the same IP address. So you don't need to use a redirect, because if you do that, those 50 websites will work from the new server, but the rest of the websites will not work at all, because they won't be present on the other server. There, there are ways to overcome this issue, and you may use a caching server, such as Varnish or Nginx, because Varnish or Nginx are able to tell the difference 
between the combination of IP and domain and just the IP address. So with Nginx and Varnish, you may, you may say if the request is for this domain name and the domain name resolves to this particular IP address, then forward this request before it even reaches the WordPress application to the new server. Other than that, you, you have to manually reconfigure the website to use the MySQL database on the new server and you won't be able to use the IP tables rather. So, uh, do you have any questions? And uh, if you do, um, if you have experienced any issues with migrations, I'll be happy to hear them because pretty much uh, this presentation is based on my experience and what issues I, I have faced. So, I'll be happy to pretty much hear the problems that you've had and how you resolve them. Yeah? Yep, of course. Yeah, uh, you do that once you log in on the server. You need to log in as a root user. If you're a regular regular user, then you won't be able to execute those commands. So those commands should be executed one after another. And what they do is that first they enable this functionality. And once it's enabled, they flush all the previous web records that you had for, for forwarding on network address translation. And the final two commands, the, uh, the final two lines here, are the important lines. Uh, those are the commands that will pretty much redirect the whole TCP traffic from the old server to the new server. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can do that on a shared server. Like um, most of the web hosting providers offer some kind of SSH access. Like if it's a shared server, you will probably have uh, SSH access through your user. So you need your password or an SSH key to open your account. And after that, you have full access to the files and to the MySQL dump command that I mentioned. So you may be able to create a backup of, uh, of the files. It's a single archive of everything. And after that, uh, you can simply download this backup through FTP or through another protocol to, to your new server. So on a shared server, you just need to ask if the hosting provider offers SSH access but for your own account. Yeah, the terminal command that you use to create the backup. Yeah, the first one creates an SQL backup of your database and it's much faster than using PHP MyAdmin because if you have a really big database, like for example 2 gigs, then PHP MyAdmin will probably time out and you have a backup that's not complete and that thing won't time out. It may it may be slow if it's uh, a really huge database, but it will work and it, it, will, it will create a pullback for the website. The second command will simply keep create an archive of the public HTML file. Oh. Uh, once you have the archive, it will contain the files and the SQL backup and you may, you may download it through FTP. Or if you are using SSH commands directly through the terminal, you may use the first command, it's parsing. It's something similar to FTP, but it's another protocol. You can pretty much tell our thing, move this file to this server. That's it. And that happens like, if, if you need to transfer like 200 websites, then you might automate the process. So you can pretty much execute the command for every single account. Once the backup is finished, upload it, then backup the other one. And for less than 10 hours, for example, you may be able to migrate 200 gigs of data. And if you're using cPanel or another, another uh, control panel that allows you to create full backups of your account, like Direct Admin is also able to do that, uh, you can use their script to do that. And once you automate it, you make a full server migration without even taking care of uh, WP config files because if you have root access, it's not possible to make it on shared server. But if you have 200 websites on your own virtual private server, then uh, you may use the cPanel tools to migrate all the accounts. And once the migration is finished, you just create the traffic redirects, and that's it. The whole server has been migrated over the wire. Yeah.
Yeah. Uh, yes, with SSH you can use WPCLI. It's uh, um, it's a command line tool. Um, I know that most of you are familiar with it. So it has an option. You just say replace this domain with this domain, and it will also also take care of the serialized data. Uh, one remark here is that when you're using plugins to migrate your website, uh, be careful because if you have custom extensions that you've developed yourself or templates or whatever, then the plugin that you're using to migrate the website may not be aware of the tables, the, the custom tables and database that your plugin uses. So in such cases, some of the plugins that migrate the website may not be able to fix the serialized data that is strictly into your own custom tables. And you have to take care of any of that. But the WPCLI pretty much checks all the tables that are that are part of your of your database. You may even use WPCLI to check only one table. If you know that the records are in this particular table. Well, yep. You did mention changing the DNS time to live. Mm -hmm. Well, changing the time to live for DNS is something you should definitely do because people that will open uh, the website, new visitors, will, will pretty much see the, the new setting in the time to live field and it's for example 5 minutes or 10 minutes, they will check this again. So their browsers will recheck the IP address to which the domain name should be resolved. But the time to live is not something that resolves the problem with data discrepancy and propagation. Because let's say that you're using an internet service provider and your internet service provider uses their own DNS servers. And when you resolve the domain name, the data is cached at your DNS servers used by your internet service provider. And they may change the TTL again. So a good thing to do is to change the TTL, but at the same time, always reconfigure the website on the old server to use the MySQL database on the new one because some people will definitely hit the website on the old server and when they do, you need to make sure that this data will be added on the correct server Yep? Do you recommend users for locking down SSH and how do you recommend that? Well, locking down SSH uh, I would say that using SSH keys and configuring the SSH daemon to work on a non-standard port and after that limiting these keys to be used only for, from certain IP addresses, it's pretty much enough. And the other thing that you may do if you're security free, like me for example, is to, to configure the server to allow connections to the port that is used by the SSH daemon only from a certain network. That's it. So if you do that, you're good to go. And something else that you may do, there's a really nice tool called Logstash. What Logstash does, you may configure it to uh, constantly check the, the log that is used by the SSH daemon. So once a new user logs to your server, Logstash may be configured to send you an email notification that someone has access to your server. And that's really a good system. Well, yeah. Apache is just a web server. Uh, you can think of it as, uh, uh, as a daemon that handles requests to your website. And Nginx is a web server, but it also offers caching functionalities. So Nginx may be able to help you if your website uh, needs to handle a lot of visitors because Nginx may cache your front page, it does full page caching. So for example, if you have uh, a blog post that's really popular, then Nginx may be configured to cache uh, this page. And when a new user opens this page, the WordPress application won't, be, uh, won't access the database at all because the whole HTML page will be pre-generated and stored into the cache and Nginx will take the results from the cache and deliver it directly to the user.
Most of the caching plugins uh, use other uh, caching uh, uh, methods. Like, uh, for example, they may uh, cache uh, pages and store them on, on, on the file drive. Like, for example, in a folder named cache. So when you open the website, the caching plugin detects that the request is for this page and it opens the cache file from the cache folder. But that's not, that's not really the best way to do it because plugins are still executing PHP code. The request will still be processed and your WordPress website will still open the PHP code of the plugin. The plugin will have to analyze the request and after that, this request will be loaded from the cache folder. And if you're using a web server, for uh, for this uh, type of caching, then the web server won't even execute the PHP code. It's blazing fast. I mean that if you're using nginx or varnish for full page caching, you'll be able to handle probably 20 to 100 times more visitors. And also your loading speed will improve because you won't execute PHP file and the PHP file won't connect to the MySQL database, it will not execute the query. The only problem with, uh, with full page caching and such proxies is uh, that when you have a new version of the same page, your WordPress website, like for example you have a page with, uh, with just a post and some images, but you decide that you have to change some text in that post. So once you change the text, the Nginx should be informed so somehow by the WordPress application that this page is no longer the same and it should be removed by the cache. So that's not natively implemented in WordPress and you need to find a way to do it and most of the managed WordPress hosting providers have their own plugins and their own plugins do exactly that. When you make a change, their own plugins connect from the backend to the Nginx server or to the Varnish server and they instruct the Varnish or Nginx server that this page has changed, it has to be removed from the cache or updated. So that's the most difficult part. Caching the content is easy, but invalidating it, it's really difficult. Yep. Caching for e-commerce sites? Well, I don't think that three minutes will be enough, but <laughs> <laughs> I would say that that's really difficult to accomplish and uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Varnish and Genex stuff but Varnish uh, has a really nice feature, it's called ESI uh, what you do is you cache the content per session so you may cache the whole site for one single user and after that cache the whole site for another user and most of the time if you have a user base of up to 5000 people that will work on a dedicated server. If you have more users and you're not on a dedicated server, you probably need to look at look at Nginx because Nginx has a module for SSL connections and also for session specific connections and it will be able to catch that data. Right now Varnish unfortunately doesn't work for SSL connections and we know that Google recently changed their algorithms so if you're not using SSL you'll be punished, <laughs> let's say it that way. And that's it. I mean, if, if you have issues with performance, uh, I'll be glad to talk about that later. You may catch up, approach me and we'll discuss it. Okay, that's it guys. Thank you for your attention and hope to see you at the next session.